Okay. So, back to the analysis workflow diagram. Uh, we've covered the QC and trimming, um, the alignment. Uh, now we will talk about, now that you have it sort of in this format, what can we do with it? Uh, in ChIP-seq, we generally do what's called peak calling. And then for RNA-seq, we have several things we might do. Transcript, film assembly, differential expression analysis, and variant calling. Um, yeah, so you've mapped your, your stuff to the sequence. Now you're trying to figure out what your signal was. Um, you might come across this sort of terminology occasionally because like in some projects like uh, ENCODE and the mod ENCODE project, when you uploaded uh, the sequence data to them, uh, you uploaded the raw data, you uploaded the mapped data, and you uploaded whatever that next set of analysis was, and they just sort of called it your signal because that was the whatever biologically significant thing that you were expecting to have had happen. Um, so there's ChIP-seq, and the ChIP-seq analysis is basically very much the same for FAIR-seq or ChIP-exo. Uh, you're basically trying to figure out where the targeted protein is actually bound within the genome. Uh, for RNA-seq, uh, you might want to do a de novo assembly of the transcriptome, uh, see the differential expression of the genes, and snip invariant calling. Okay. ChIP-seq and peak binding. So, for anyone who's done chromatin immunoprecipitation, you know that your isolation of DNA fragments is always not perfect. You've always gotten some amount of non-specific stuff that's come through. Uh, it's also the case you might have a bad antibody, uh, but in that case you'll probably have to junk your experiment and try again. Um, what's often done in ChIP-seq experiments is you'll do as well the mock IP, which is you basically go through the exact same procedure except you leave out the antibodies just to see what fragments of DNA will non-specifically stick to your beads and will come through anyways. Um, the basic idea of peak finding is to find the areas with lots and lots of overlapping reads. Um, there are several techniques that have been developed to, to call peaks. Um, different proteins will have uh, different types of binding. They may be very non, sort of have a broad binding over areas. They may have very narrow binding. Um, there are many programs which do this. Here's a list of them. Um, I sometimes feel that like pretty much everyone decides that their particular set of proteins that they study have its own unique binding pattern. Therefore, they themselves have to write a new custom peak finder. And that is why this list is not even like comprehensive currently. So I've talked a lot about that. What's actually sort of going on in sort of detail? So you imagine here, here is the protein or the protein complex that you're targeting. Uh, the antibody stuck onto some part of this. This is the part of the genome that it was uh, bound to. Uh, there's probably multiple locations, but this is one. Um, in the case of single end reads, here would have been the fragments that you had, and then this would be the part in, in the thicker part that actually got read by the sequencer. Um, so in the early days, especially when we only did single end sequencing, uh, this basically would manifest as sort of two peaks. You have a set of peaks, uh, have the orientation this direction, and a set of reads that piled up over here, the orientation this direction, and you would have some sort of algorithm that would decide that these two peaks are in fact peaks, and that it should find some sort of middle ground between them, which is the actual distribution of the sort of hypo uh, well, not hypothetical, but from our point of view, the unknown part of this uh, sequence that we did not actually get um, sequenced, and this is the general area where that protein was bound. Uh, this is basically just another diagram of the same thing, uh, sort of showing some of the situations where you might have it such that the parts that you've read are not that close together. There's a gap between them. So this is one condition that you should have to consider. Another that um, your fragments were sort of more broadly, and so there's some that sort of uh, to go in each direction but have this sort of overlap area and the sort of algorithms you use, you have to sort of decide which of these is the case and then make a guess about what you should call the actual sort of peak area between it. Um, you sort of have similar uh, considerations with paired-in stuff. 
but it becomes a little bit easier because you can imagine you've got this other end of the sequence as well, so you actually have an idea of what your actual length of your fragment was, and it sort of makes all this easier. Um, here is three graphs from the UCSC browser just to give you an idea of like some real data. Um, in some sense, this top case is sort of your ideal case. You've got some sort of binding pattern that is very clear, very distinct, and there's not a lot of noise around it. Um, you can also have um, binding patterns that are very broad, um, not as high, not necessarily as high above the background noise. Um, this could be because it's a much larger protein complex or it actually has multiple binding sites in the area. Uh, some of these might be distinct ones or just issues with how the, the reads have come out. And down here, uh, sort of like your least favorable case is the sort of non-specific binding isn't too much lower than the actual signal area they want. So here it's going to be a little bit harder to figure out where you're calling your peaks just because your background stuff is almost peak-like itself. All right. I will discuss one of the programs. Uh, this is called Max. Um, the idea behind the program is that it is a model-based peak caller. Um, the parameters that you give it are more about sort of guiding the program rather than trying to give it a sort of more rigid definition in terms of expected length or width or height of your peaks. Um, what it does is it sort of has a beginning idea of what it thinks peak should be and then it sort of looks through all the data you have and starts developing a model that it feels matches within certain statistical parameters a bunch of things that look like peaks. Um, now this becomes a lot more powerful if you do use that input control, uh, the mock IP. Um, in the simplest case, you're just thinking of it, oh, what's the sort of generally expected background sort of um, level I can I expect? The thing that Max does is it uses the input control to create something it calls negative peaks. Basically what it does is it reverses the analysis. First, it does this sort of analysis where it treats your sample, uh, which is the actual immunoprecipitation and the noise as a sort of uh, control to that. Then it flips it around where it says, I'm going to treat the control like it was a sample and the sample like it's the control and tries to figure out how many times would it have called a peak in this condition. Um, and depending on the locations of where those are uh, compared to the peaks it called in the normal condition, it sort of uses that to feed into its stats for p-values and its false discovery rate. Um, output of Max, um, it has a number of files. Uh, the two most useful ones will be basically an Excel compatible tab format file. Basically just have a list of locations, uh, basically a start end of what it thinks a peak is, um, a score for how good it thinks the peak is, uh, the p-value, the FDR value for each of them. It also provides uh, bed files, uh, which I alluded to earlier. These are basically uh, the exact same data that you see in the Excel file, except uh, it's in the bed format, so these can be loaded up to the UCSC browser, um, basically just as a start and a stop and um, some sort of score value. Uh, you can use these sort of this earlier these sort of lines down here, these bars underneath each of these, is basically a bed file saying, this is where I think a peak is. And what you're looking up above it is the actual pileup of reads. So you can say, oh, it called a peak here, and this definitely looks like a peak to me. Um, those files, uh, that little peak that you saw um, is a wig, or what's called a wiggle file. It's basically a count at each base pair of how many of each of these reads, how many reads were on top of this base pair. Um, it also is sometimes somewhat condensed where it just does that in a 10 base pair window, uh, makes the file a bit smaller and more manageable. Um, and for the really intrepid, um, if you use the R statistics package, it actually outputs the models that it had used, that it had come up with while doing the analysis as a as an R file, and you can sort of import it into R and sort of look at what it thought were peaks. Um, 
There's a new version of Max called Max 2. It's not officially been released, but I believe we have installs of it here at UNC. Um, it generally improves the algorithms. It's better at finding different sorts of peaks, um, especially because the group that works on this uh, worked with one of the groups at UNC um, who is mostly interested in these uh, histone peaks. And histone peaks can tend to be very broad signals. So one of the things that Max 2 does better is it's pretty good at finding broad and other sorts of peaks 